it is reasonable to assume that if the blood serum level of B12 is below the normal reference range, then a person has a B12 deficiency. It is also reasonable to assume that if the blood serum level of B12 is within the normal reference range, then a person cannot have B12 deficiency. However, there are two problems with this assumption. The first is the unreliability of the blood testing methods we have had for decades. Professor A. David Smith, a recognized expert on the scientific aspects of vitamin B12, described the uncertain reliability of commercially available assays for blood levels of B12. In a 2018 study, Professor A. David Smith and colleagues said in the following highlighted blue text, the brain is particularly vulnerable, in children, inadequate B12 stunts brain and intellectual development. Suboptimal B12 status, serum B12 less than 300 pmol slash L, is very common, occurring in 30 to 60% of the population, in particular, in pregnant women and in less developed countries. Thus, many tens of millions of people in the world may suffer harm from having a poor B12 status. Public health steps are urgently needed to correct this inadequacy. There is currently only one commercial assay procedure for assessing the quantity of B12 in a blood sample used in laboratories worldwide. This is the chemiluminescence based assay, combined binding luminescence assay, CBLA. However, in 2012, a leading B12 researcher Professor Ralph Carmel, cast doubt on the reliability of this method in a report, showing that CBLA kits gave falsely high readings from patients with pernicious anemia, with failure rates ranging from 22 to 35 percent. This was not the first time that such problems had been reported. In a letter to the editor of Clinical Chemistry in 2000, Professor Carmel wrote, We wish to report a serious problem in the chemiluminescence-based assay, CBLA, for serum B12 levels. The problem is urgent for two reasons. One, our findings suggest that many B12 deficient patients are being missed, and, two, the assay is used by increasing numbers of laboratories. Many examples of patients who were clearly clinically B12 deficient, but whose blood tests showed results within the normal range, can be found in the research. Examples of contradictory results from different test methods are also shown in many studies. In 2010, the American Society for Hematology reported a case of false normal vitamin B12 levels caused by assay error. Again, in 2016, another study reported only 19% sensitivity of the serum B12 test. In Japan, where other automated competitive protein binding assays are used, inconsistent results produced by three different tests were reported. Many experts now consider that the serum B12 blood test is of limited diagnostic value as a standalone marker. However, the CBLA replaced older microbiologic and radioisotope dilution assays during the past decades without scrutiny by the mainstream medical community. Testing samples of human blood may give normal range readings for people who have B12 deficiency symptoms, but who would get a low blood serum B12 under the previous radioisotope dilution assay to confirm their B12 deficiency symptoms. What CBLA is binding to instead of B12 is still unknown. However, knowing that people are being told that they have a normal level of total B12 in their blood, when they clearly have symptoms of B12 deficiency, is doing a grave injustice to those being tested. The second problem is that the standard B12 blood serum test does not differentiate between the active and inactive forms of B12, giving a false reading of the B12 available for use, described as functional vitamin B12. In the 1980s, a pioneering New York-based physician slash scientist Victor Herbert put forward the view that about 80% of B12 in the body is bound to haptocorin, a storage protein, and is therefore inactive. In contrast, the remaining active fraction is bound to transcobalamin 2. This combination complex, called holotranscobalamin, holo TC, enters the cells for metabolic reactions needed by the body. When both active and inactive forms are measured, total serum B12 may appear within the normal reference range, despite the lower critical active holo TC bound fraction. In addition, there is no national or international agreement about a safe and evidence-based reference range for the measurement of B12 for patients presenting with symptoms of B12 deficiency. The cutoff threshold varies significantly between laboratories worldwide, while no worldwide accepted reference range exists. 
The BMJ best practice suggests that greater than 350 pg slash ml is unlikely, 201 to 350 pg slash ml is possible, and less than 200 pg slash ml is probable for B12 deficiency. However, as Professor Smith points out in his letter, severe B12 deficiency symptoms can manifest in patients with B12 levels across the entire normal range. Under these circumstances, arguments about what the minimum threshold level of B12 in the blood should be, becomes academic. It is better to diagnose B12 deficiency using a combination of signs and symptoms, including the blood B12 level, but the focus should mainly be on symptoms, family history, and a trial of B12 therapy. Several other methods that can be used to determine vitamin B12 deficiency should be routine. These include 1. Measurement of plasma homocysteine. Levels of homocysteine increase from the early stages of vitamin B12 deficiency. However, one drawback to using homocysteine levels as a biomarker of B12 deficiency is that a high homocysteine level can indicate other conditions such as folate deficiency, vitamin B6 deficiency, or other illnesses. 2. Measurement of plasma methylmalonic acid, MMA. Levels of MMA increase with vitamin B12 deficiency. As with homocysteine, a raised MMA can also be caused by other illnesses, but it is more specific to vitamin B12 deficiency than a raised homocysteine. In summary, the British Society for Hematology recommends considering plasma homocysteine and plasma MMA as additional tests if available. In addition, it suggests using hollow TC as a more indicative routine test for vitamin B12 deficiency than serum B12 in the future. Many other experts also recommend a combination of tests. While guidelines for diagnosing B12 deficiency-induced anemia can be found in the publications of medical authorities, guidelines for diagnosing vitamin B12 deficiency in the absence of anemia are distinctly lacking. The UK's National Institute for Care and Excellences NICE, Clinical Knowledge Summaries, which is a critical online reference work for GPs, have no separate entry for vitamin B12 deficiency, and it is only mentioned concerning anemia. The critical question becomes, how do we diagnose vitamin B12 deficiency without guidelines considering neurological and neuropsychiatric symptoms? Thanks for watching.